Hello and welcome to the Artisan Traveller podcast, episode numero two. I recorded this podcast in a pub, which was quite noisy at the time. Uh, there was a bit of background music, a little bit of uh, you know people coming and going. Um, but the podcast itself, uh, my microphone on my side was a little bit low in places, but the audio and the recording of the guest is absolutely spot on. My guest today was Stevie Gray, a stand-up comedian who's finished a tour of Edinburgh. I really hope you enjoy the podcast. It's a fascinating listen. So here goes. How are you doing, mate? I'm really well, Chris. How are you, mate? Yeah, good, thank you. So your first, was it your first solo show in Edinburgh? Yep, first solo show this year. I've been up to the Fringe about five or six times now, but this is the first time I've ever done a whole hour. So I did the whole month, 25 nights, doing an hour every night this year. It's amazing. So your show was called Arctic Monkey's Midlife Crisis. Have you had a midlife crisis yet? I think so. I think going up to Edinburgh and putting most of my life savings into an hour-long show is one of the most vain things I've ever done, so I think that can be described as a midlife crisis. I've bought a barbecue. That's my midlife crisis. Oh, have you? Proper one? Proper barbecue, yeah. Weber, everything. I'm like a weird guy that stands outside in like November when it's like, ice cold outside. His neighbours looking at him like, what is he doing? Oh, nice work. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Barbecue Champ, the ITV show? I've heard of that. The, uh, I had a good friend, Duncan Mayers, I used to work in IT with him, fantastic bloke, but he built his own barbecue and then went on an ITV reality show hosted by Mylene Class, oh you know, God. from Hearsay, yeah, yeah, that is it, you need to get yourself on that. That's crazy, I'll have to get on that, yeah, if I get to that level one, build a own stuff, yeah, 100%. So, you held, you held like a daily blog of your activities in Edinburgh, look quite great some days and then some days not so good would you say the experience was everything you hoped it would be or was it sort of more than that or i think edinburgh was pretty much what i expected it to be money wise i made a loss of around five thousand pounds which i had budgeted for i know some comics go up there they lose ten thousand twenty thousand a few people make a profit but if i'm looking at money I hit exactly what I thought I was going to hit, about a five grand loss. The problem I had was just getting people in the venue. I really would have loved, my room held 60, and I played to 60 people twice. And what I would have really loved is if you could have said, right, you can play to 40 people every day, I would have snapped your hand off. Because I played to five people one day, and then most of the time it was under 20. But for those few days where I had 30 or more in, it was worth every penny. That's amazing. So, literally, when I was up there, it was my first fringe, so it was buzzing and everything. I couldn't believe how busy it was and how many venues there are. How do you kind of make yourself stand out from the crowd in terms of like, do you have to do something particularly different in terms of like, I don't know, promotion or anything like that? How would you say to a first time performer at Edinburgh is the way to stand out for your show in particular? I think if you had a strong brand or a strong name of the show, or a theme, or something that you can say about yourself, which is slightly different. I really try to piggy tail on the back of the Arctic Monkeys, just hoping people like the Arctic Monkeys and could say, oh, well, if we like the Arctic Monkeys, then maybe we should give this show a try. Not quite sure how well that worked out. I think I got a few people in just because it's called Arctic Monkeys Midlife Crisis. However, I just think you need to go out, you need to be able to flyer your own show just say to people look come and watch me this is what I do this is what I'm all about but again it's soul destroying you are you are begging for an audience there were days when I was literally trying to plead to people please come and watch the show I really wish that you didn't have to do it I would love to go to Edinburgh and for someone just to say right your room's full every day we'll sort all that all you need to do is turn up and perform but when you're in the rain for two hours before begging people to come and watch you yeah that's that's not for me. So strong brand, strong oh, image. Strong image. It's hard going, isn't it? Like those days motivating yourself when it's raining outside and you know, the numbers are down in particular, you know, to get going for the next day. What was your kind of routine in Edinburgh? What would you do sort of day to day? How did the day start and then the day kind of progress from there? So I still do a day job in IT and for them to let me have the month off, we came to an agreement where I would work in the mornings, nine till twelve. So I would do that. But then I also, my wife and my young child, they both came up to Edinburgh with me, which at first I was a bit sceptical about, thinking, will this actually work? Do I need to be spending more time doing my day job on, and the evening job? 
But actually, that was the best thing that could have happened because they took me out of that Edinburgh bubble. So I'd work in the morning and I'd spend the afternoon with my wife and my child and we'd go out and we'd go to the library or they had a big book festival there or we went to food festivals or we'd just go to the park and just all hang out, have a like, really good afternoon. And then as soon as five o'clock turns up, then it, it's back, get your head on to the gig for tonight and you're back trying to beg for an audience. But having, having, those, having the family there was the best thing for me because so many people go up there and they've got nothing. They just get lost in the bubble of Edinburgh. And it is, it's awful for them because they become obsessed with ticket sales, become obsessed with reviews, competitions, how people are perceiving them, how other people are doing, are they doing better than me, am I doing better than this person? And to get out of that bubble was just perfect for me because... I would get obsessed with the reviews. If someone told me I was brilliant, I'd believe them. If someone said I had the worst show in the world, I'd believe them as well. I'm very up and down, so I need to stay grounded. That's a really good answer. I like that. I don't, it's got to be like that in comedy, hasn't it? You, know, you do have your, your highs and your lows, but ultimately the highs are, are through the roof, aren't they? It's amazing. Um, speaking of comedy, how did you get started? Was it kind of the, the Peter Kay influence up north? You know, being sort of near in the Manchester area, it was around sort of 2000, 2008 you started? Yeah, so basically I've been a comedy fan, a bit of a comedy nerd since being very young. And even in my pre-teens, when I was like 11, 12, I used to send off for old DV, well, not DVDs, it's like cassettes, VHS cassettes. And I had a collection of about 300 cassettes of old comedians from around the world. So my knowledge was really quite good. My dad was really into like the Northern Working Men's Club, like ITV's The Comedians in the 70s. So you have comedians like Ken Goodwin, he was on there. And obviously you get the people, like, people remember it for like Bernard Manning, that type of comedian. But I was brought up constantly watching comedy, going on holidays to Blackpool, seeing the comedians at the end of the pier. But then I built up a massive knowledge of all these comedians. Peter Kay didn't really come onto my radar until I was about 18, 19. And the first time I saw it, I just, I liked it, but I couldn't quite work it out. And then after watching T Top of the Tower, I think the second time I watched it, you realise, oh my God, that is actually genius. But I think he was an influence for me, knowing he was Northern, knowing he was from Bolton, and he was just talking about things Northern people do. But I think for me, bigger influences, Harry Hill, Definitely. I used to watch that and think, I, that is just so silly. I would love to go on stage and just be really silly. And then at the extreme of that, people like Chris Rock. It's like, I watch him and just the way he emphasises his words. I just like, that's what I'd want to be. I'd love to be kind of Harry Hill, Chris Rock. I think I dropped the Chris Rock style of that, but hopefully there's still a bit of Harry, Harry Hill influence in my act. So you're literally taking little bits and pieces from other comedians and almost sort of formulating your own act sort of off the back of that, really. I think so. I think when you start, you, you are basically a tribute act to your favourite act. It's like you go and watch any open mic spot and you can see, you can definitely see who they've been watching at Live at the Apollo. When I was coming up, Stuart Lee was a massive influence on so many open spots. And if your listeners are unfamiliar with Stuart Lee, he has a long, drawn-out delivery which he is a master of. But when you see people that don't understand the art try and tell a joke over 10 minutes without any punchlines, it is, it's not nice to sit through a night of that. No, definitely not. That's why I kind of don't envy one-liner comedians as much. I know in the last podcast with Matt Bragg, he was saying that the beauty of one-liners comedians is that they can literally try any new material and fit it in their set and it sort of fits in seamlessly because they're going from one joke to the next joke to the next joke. But... For someone who does maybe observational stuff, it's not as easy, is it? No, definitely not. And my style, since you've seen me, I've started putting the stories in. So there's the birth story that I do, which is 10 minutes long. And before that, any story I would tell would be, if it was over a minute, you know, I don't, I think I've probably dropped anything longer than a minute because I used to be frightened to death. I can't be speaking whilst they're not laughing. I used to have this fear, if the audience aren't laughing, I'm doing something wrong, but then you realise you can have a longer setup. You just need to make sure that there's a punchline at the end of it, because there's nothing worse than having to move on from something after it's taken you ten minutes to get out. That awkward silence. Oh yeah. yeah. 
So you're a, obviously a musical stand-up act as well. You've got uh, songs intertwined with your jokes and your observations and your routines. But what came? I suppose it's a bit of a chicken and egg question. What came first, the music or the stand-up? Stand-up. I learned to play the guitar whilst I was on stage. So I I was on the open mic circuit in London, and I realised I had two friends who both had guitars, and they were getting more gigs than any of the other acts that weren't doing this, even more than the one-liners or the storytellers. And I was saying, why? How are you getting these gigs? And they say, oh, like everybody loves a guitar act. If you've got a guitar, you can basically grab a middle spot of most of these open mic nights. They like it to break up the night. So I just I was at work one day. I asked somebody, "Has anybody got a guitar I could borrow?" So then I turned up. I used to carry this guitar around in London in a bin bag, right? and I used to go on stage and I just used to do my acts, but like just play random strings whilst I was saying the jokes. And then I'd say, "Right, I'm going to sing a song." And even though I didn't know any chords, I would like strum what I thought was a chord and try and do a joke. And then one day I did a joke and someone said, oh, that's really funny, that maybe you should learn what the actual chords are for the song you was trying to play. So I did that and then it kind of snowballs from there and then before you know it, you're writing jokes which are set to music. And then I had that song which was called Wife Beater. It's like, I tell you what, this day and age, you can't really sing a song like that. I wrote this song years ago, it was about 2009, 2010, and at the time, it opened so many doors for me because it's like, oh, here comes Stevie and he's got this song about domestic violence. And even though it was so tongue in cheek, it could have been more obvious that I was joking. It has since closed doors for me in the last few years because people have Googled me, seen this song, Wife Beater, and said, oh, we can't have him on. You know, he's obviously advocating beating women, which he definitely wasn't there to do. But uh, Mecca Bingo actually cancelled me from a string of gigs on the back. Of the, their, their bingo hall's called Mecca. It's like, they can't call me controversial. Especially when you're boosting the sales, the sales of uh, Stella Artois as well. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, it's, so yeah, that, that was the point of the song. It was about my dad drinking uh, oh, no. <laughs> my dad drinking 10 pints of Stella and going on beating my mum. It was so ridiculous. But people, people believe you. People take things at face value. They've got to realise if you're a comedian, you are joking. Most of the things you will hear are made up. I'm slightly different in that I say tales from real life and this funny thing happened to me. And a lot of it is based completely in reality. But then to hear that... But I used to have people come up to me and say, oh, I, I beat my woman about as well. And you're thinking, no, this isn't the point of this. You're obviously misunderstanding what I wanted out of this. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't laugh. Well, we should, because it is a joke, obviously. But there is, like, people get... We are living in a day and age where people do get really offended by, you know, does it kind of limit what you can say on stage and what you can't? Or is it just a completely open field, still comedy now? I think you can still say whatever you want, but you need to be prepared for the repercussions of this. You could go on and you could do a topical joke about what has happened in the news. And, yeah, as long as you're, you're free to back that up when somebody records it on a camera phone and then uploads it without context. Because context is key in this game. And if people see you, obviously, Mecca Bingo have seen me singing a song about beating up women. They obviously didn't see that it was actually me and my dad having an argument and me just trying to actually say to my dad, look, I'm going to win this argument. But yeah, if you, as long as you're, you're strong enough to back up what you believe, I think you can say what you want. But I think there's a lot of keyboard warriors out there that would try and end your career quicker than it is to tell your joke. I remember when we were standing outside the Arts Club, not too far from where we are here at the, uh, the Salmon, lovely pub in Leicester, it's a bit of a cheeky plug for uh, the YouTube and iTunes audience. Um, run by the fantastic comedian that is Alex Hilton. Um, we were outside the Arts Club and we were talking about, um, I think it might have been actually been inside the Arts Club at this point, when we were talking about um, context again with an audience. We were in a cellar and the opening joke I thought of straight away for any of the, com the comics to do was a joke about Fred West. But then of course you look at the audience and it's professionals and the people that may not have sort of taken it so well. How important is it to judge the audience 
and the yeah. mood of the room before you go into a joke, say like the, the wife beater routine or a Fred West routine, is it quite important, would you say, to... Yeah, I agree with you in that. I think you can look at an audience and say, it's probably best I'll leave these jokes behind tonight. However, I would say if you start second-guessing what the audience are going to laugh at, you're doing yourself a disservice. Especially if you're an MC or an opener, you don't really know what you're walking into. And I've seen so many people walk onto a, an audience that are primarily elderly. They may be 60-plus, and they think, right, I won't say all the rude stuff. And they play it safe. And then the person after them goes on and just does an hour or 20 minutes of absolute filth. And the audience love it and they really go for it. And they're going for the swearing, they're going for the dirty, the naughty jokes. And the first comedian's thinking, well, why didn't I do that? And it's because they judged, they thought, oh no, I'm going to play it safe. But at the same time, if the first comedian goes out and launches straight into the dirty stuff, they could completely throw the gig for themselves and potentially for the people to follow them. So I think the longer you're in the game, the more you will realise what you can and can't do. And even though I've been doing this over 10 years now, I still don't know fully who will go for what. That's a good, one. That's good advice for any, uh, any comedy getting started, for sure. Um, so your life around comedy, obviously you mentioned that you work full-time, you've got a fitness around your, your family life. How do you juggle like family life the comedy and have time for yourself at the end of it. I've got a very understanding wife <laughs> at home who is amazing, who also has a really good job. So she's working, she's but she's putting in twenty hour days and being a mother on top of this. So young Freddie, he's now at nursery. So my wife will drop him off. We both go to work. I'll pick him up. My wife comes home from work. I do the cooking. She looks after Freddie put Freddie to bed, I go out, do a gig, she'll continue her work, and then we reconvene about 1am, say goodnight, go to bed, alarm set for 5 to 6, rinse and repeat, and it's it's very tiring. I would love it if the comedy could come up chumps and try and match the salary I earn in IT, but I just think I'm years away from that happening. But it's just it's just good fun, as long as my body can take it, I'm more than, and as long as my wife is more than happy to continue this charade, <laughs> have really long days, then yeah, I'll, I'll try and keep it up, but we have very, very little time for ourselves at the minute. It does sound like a very hectic lifestyle, and I can definitely relate to that with vlogging, because it's literally like, we work in two shift patterns, so I'll sort of start maybe later in the, probably late afternoon, actual working, uh, do the vlog in the morning, Ali then comes in, takes over, um, in the evening about five o'clock when she gets home, then we work all the way through till the early hours, so it's... It's it, crazy. It's cool, but I think it's if you want something enough, you know, you kind of make it work, and it's you, you can definitely work around that. It's it's a good, it's a good way to to test your relationship, I suppose, in many ways. Uh, she's uh, she's great. So you've travelled around quite a bit. You've um, before all this uh, family and comedy and everything else. What was the most remarkable place you went to around the world on your travels? I've done travelling twice, two big stints. The first one was 2007, where I went away for nine months, did the classic Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, America. And for my honeymoon, we did South America. I think from the first, from the first trip, Malaysia was amazing. And I think the reason I love that so much is because if you take Kuala Lumpur out of it, there wasn't anything there where people were saying, you need to go and see this. Whereas you go to Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, you speak to other travellers, you must do this, you must go here, you must do this, oh, you're not going there, oh. <laughs> Whereas Malaysia, no one said anything about it. There was no no people saying, oh, you, you really must do this. Have you ever been to Malacca? No one says this. So you go there and you're so surprised at how amazing it is and wonderful and the food's great and the people are lovely. So I love there. New Zealand was the main highlight of that trip, though. I'm not sure if it's the same now, but then it was just so great just to hire a camper van and just travel around and every day you'd be driving and it was like driving through a film like everywhere you'd go within an hour's drive you'd see the beaches you'd see mountains you'd see fields you'd see the sea and it's just glorious the volcanoes absolutely amazing and 
from the honeymoon in South America, there was a, a place called the Perito Marino Glacier in Argentina, which is a huge glacier which you sit watching and it carves itself. So this huge, great big blocks of ice just go crashing into the water. The sound is incredible. It's deafening. And you could YouTube it. It's probably not the same on YouTube as it is in real life. But see that Perito Marino Glacier. Well worth, well worth the trip to. When uh, we went to Argentina as well, we went to uh, Buenos Aires, we twinned it with a holiday to Rio de Janeiro as well. And um, it wasn't until after we'd booked it that I'd done a bit of research on YouTube and I found that a place we were near where we were staying, a place called San Telmo, where they've got the Boca Juniors Stadium and all that. Um, there was a video, it's on YouTube, I'll leave a link in the description box below for the YouTube viewers. Um, but there was a guy uh, doing a cycle tour, an American, uh, and he was cycling kind of 10 paces apart. And this guy comes out the side street on a motorbike and just puts puts a gun at him. Whoa. <laughs> and just uh, the guy just for some reason he's after his bag. Obviously he's got something in his bag, and um, the guy just won't give it. I suppose Americans are a bit less scared scared of guns yeah. than maybe we are here in the UK. But oh, I would have just wow. given him whatever he wanted and run. I think. Yeah. It's a scary place. <laughs> oh yeah, it definitely is because my wife and I we had an incident when we was on the Peru Ecuador border where we had our laptop stolen from us. And it's one of the most frightening things in the world. And what, what had happened is, we thought we were fine. We thought, everyone said, you're going to get robbed at this border. And we said, no, there's no, we won't, you know, we won't get robbed. We'll play it so safe. And we actually got robbed from the bus conductor. So the bus conductor came around and he was selling everybody tickets. And when he got to us, we said, two tickets, please. And he said, oh, I'm really sorry. You know, right, in Spanish, he was speaking. Like, Lo siento. <laughs> so he said he hadn't got the change on him at the moment. So he'd write an IOU. So he wrote us a ticket out on this paper, passed the paper to my wife. And then he, she passed it to me. And then we both woke up about seven hours later. And it was like LSD style. Oh. I don't know what the drug was on it, but we both handled this paper. Oh my god! And then yeah, we woke up in the middle of a desert, and it was oh, it was horrific. So we had luckily we still had our passport, still had our phone. But, like the camera had gone, the laptop had gone, some of our clothes yeah. had gone, and we're just trapped in the middle, the middle of a foreign country, thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know what we're gonna do here. Was it really a desert, or was it the result of the LSD? Do you think? <laughs> it was a. Yeah, trying trying to speak to the police in pidgin Spanish. When when did you realise? It's like oh, when the dragon got on the bus. That's yeah. when we realised something was up. But yeah, that was really frightening. I and mean, they could have done anything, you know. It's to get away. If you would say, look, you'll lose the laptop and your camera, and a few clothes, you, I'd snap your hand off. Because if my passport would have gone, or they would have done anything to myself or my wife, you know, you'd never recover from that. No. So I'm, I'm happy just yeah. to give it up if anybody pulls a knife on you, especially if you my high, my way. There's no way I'm fighting back. No, it's, it can. It's a lovely place. We should probably point out South America, but uh, just be careful if you do go there. I remember, I think it was Rio de Janeiro we landed at at night, and literally, it's, it's, it is the most lawless place on earth, pretty much. I never saw a police officer outside of the airport the whole time I was there, but when. We arrived at uh, Rio de Janeiro. It's like a big kind of like ticker tape thing. Like they have a cinema. You know when you're queuing up at the cinemas, and the border control was about sort of 20 foot down this ticker tape. And all that was separating me from entering Brazil was this little thing. Oh wow! And I just thought if I duck under this, I could just be in Brazil and no one would know. Because as soon as you get down the escalators at Rio Airport, it's just straight into the arrivals and you're, you're in the country effectively. Oh, I'm glad you had this because yeah. myself and my wife, when we were reading about entering Brazil, we heard that they had all these questions. If you said you were a couple, they had so many people trying to enter illegally that the customs officers would ask you all these questions and you had to know it about the other person who was with as well. So we spent the whole Mr. journey. Mrs. Yeah, we did. We, we learned everything about each other that we thought they were going to ask. And when we got there, they just said, welcome to Brazil and let us in. So now I've got all this knowledge about my wife's shoe size. All I think it was basically my wife trying to uh, let me know what she wants for Christmas. That sounds about right. Yeah, I think it was completely different in Argentina because you land there and literally you have to go through two scanners. The police look really friendly until you approach them, and then they actually just turn into someone completely different and 
pass for your fingerprints, oh, yeah. your photographs. Well, I'll, I'll then you go through a secondary well. scanner as well, um, which then uh, like obviously detects for drugs and things like that. And, and then the taxi drivers effectively rob you outside. So it's, yeah. <laughs> well, I think you may have heard me tell this story. I think I may have done it at the Leicester Comedy Festival yeah. when I was uh, about. There's a, a person from Manchester who shares the same birthday as me, also called Stephen James Gray, who then went off fighting for ISIS. So now I get stopped in every single airport. He's the same height as me, 5'8", green eyes. He's got Manchester on his passport, and he went to fight for ISIS. So now I cannot get in or out of any airport without being stopped. Those electric gates that they have, useless for me. I paid extra for my e-passport. And it does nothing. It just says seek assistance. I, I'm on first name terms with the people at East Midlands Airport now. <laughs> so definitely arriving at the airport an extra time. So yeah, you yeah, have to. Oh dear. So a couple of last questions, really. Um, what is one of the most unusual venues you performed in? So the one you mentioned before, I've <laughs> forgotten about that. It was the. Queen's Arts Club, is it? Queen? It used to be, for, for anyone who's outside of Leicester, probably who's listening from America, um, the Arts Club has a history of um, being a venue for swingers. <laughs> and that's what the, the cellar effectively was. Exactly. Because I thought they were joking, the compere, Jay Neal, he made reference to the fact and everybody chuckled. And then it was only when he said to me, no, it actually used to be a sex dungeon. And they still had the hooks in the walls <laughs> from where they used to chain people up. So that, that was quite strange. And I also, another weird venue, I used to be the resident compere of the King's Head Hotel in Sirencester, which is in the Cotswolds in the UK. Gorgeous place to visit. Anybody listening that wants to visit there. But the hotel is haunted, and it's one of the most haunted places in the UK. And people, they've had builders in there that have refused to work because all of a sudden young girls would walk through the walls and look at them and then walk back out and they've had grown men in tears refusing to work at the hotel. But yeah, that's, a, that's definitely an unusual venue. But gorgeous. If you ever get a chance, it's like a nuclear bunker. So it's a bit like the Cavern Club where the Beatles used to play. Uh, oh, that's awesome. But haunted. <laughs> definitely worth a visit. If you're ever fancying a gig there, uh, do head along. You might get some uh, extra entertainment, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> Uh, last question, it's kind of a running comedian's theme really, but what is your favourite service station? Gloucester. I don't know how anybody could say anything other. Everyone loves Gloucester. Gloucester's mate. The food at Gloucester services is better than some restaurants, some top class restaurants. The sausage, even the sausage rolls, the sausage rolls are massive. They are, it's just delicious. So yeah, if I ever get a gig down that way, Bristol, Gloucester, anywhere around there, I'd, I'd go, I'd take the gig purely based on that services. And you get a lot of love for Gloucester services right here on the podcast. So I hope you've enjoyed listening today. Uh, like, subscribe if you're on YouTube. Uh, you can also subscribe on iTunes. Um, and we'll be back next week with another podcast. Thank you for listening and see you later.